Hi, I'm Shashank Bhargav and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. In this episode, we talk about an interfaith wedding being stopped in Uttar Pradesh. We also talk about how over 200 people fell sick in a district in Andhra Pradesh. But first, we talk about the COVID-19 vaccination. On Friday, Prime Minister Narendra Modi told leaders of all parties that experts had said that vaccines against COVID-19 would be ready in the next few weeks and that they would be manufactured on a large scale in the country. He also said that the inoculation will begin as soon as the scientists give the go-ahead. In this segment, we speak to Conan Sheriff, who reports on Health for the Indian Express, about the challenges that India will face in rolling out the COVID-19 vaccines. And he first points out that right now in India, there are at least five vaccine candidates in different stages of clinical trials. Three of them are in late stage, two of them in phase three and uh, another one in late phase two. When do we expect a uh, Prime Minister in the last two meetings uh, has hinted that it's going to be in the next few weeks. So that means that in the next few days, we might have two of them. One is Serum Institute of India and ICMR's uh, Oxford vaccine, which is in the phase three trials. They might uh, move the DGCI for an emergency use authorization. And ICMR, they have just finished their first dose and they have a second dose and then a follow-up. So they will also move with their preliminary data to the DGCI in the next few days. So we are expecting the emergency approvals uh, in the next few days and the actual rollout early next year. He says that when we talk about the rollout, we are talking about the first group that will be vaccinated. That is the frontline healthcare workers. According to the database that the government has, there are around one crore of them. But eventually, the idea is that the vaccination program will be carried out in the entire country which has a population of around 1.3 billion. This is unprecedented. And while Conan says that we still aren't sure who all will get the vaccine, for example, what will happen to people who have already recovered, the challenges are still going to be many. Starting from the fact that there are going to be multiple vaccine candidates. Uh, we will have at least three to four in the beginning. Then you, you will have some candidates which are two dose and one candidate which has three dose. So you have to have to, to track them from the point they are given from the manufacturer to the first storehouse, from the storehouse, then it goes to the states, the state storehouses. From there, then it goes to, you know, uh, the PHCs or the CHCs and then to the designated uh, centers where you actually are going to vaccinate. So it's for the first time, you will have multiple candidates that will be used for the same infection. So that's the first big challenge. So you have to track all of them at each point. The second is that you will have a product in the market which will be based on an emergency use authorization, which means that these are products which are not undergone the complete clinical trials, which takes usually the four to 10 years is what has been the norm so far. So you don't know what kind of adverse reaction they will have in a such a large population. And this is especially important, he says, considering we will have the adult population being vaccinated for the first time at this scale. And this will include people with comorbidities. This is also the reason why he says that vaccinators will have to be trained accordingly to look out for adverse reactions. Because in polio and the child immunization, all these mechanisms are very well established by the UNICEF and WHO because these products are there in the market for decades. But here you will have a new product. So, you know, diagnosing those adverse reactions by the vaccinators, by the doctors, all of that becomes very important. So training them will become very important at a very decentralized level. Here I'm talking about the district and block. In fact, the other thing that Conan points out is that if there are adverse reactions in a particular community, then there will be vaccine hesitancy. So you will have to rope in NGOs, you have to have a communication strategy, which the government has already sent to blocks and districts about how communication has to be done. You know, because vaccine hesitancy be, if, can be a big hurdle. People will not come out there to, you know, get themselves immunized. So all of this then becomes a big challenge. In fact, in other words, you can say that the block level strategy or the task force will become actually the prime movers of this entire immunization program. So how they will be able to train, monitor, supervise, 
just beyond procurement which which like you are saying the center will do it is going to become the most critical and the essential part of the drive as far as the strength of trained community healthcare workers is concerned conan says that india has experience because of its universal immunization program where more than 2 crore newborn babies are vaccinated but like mentioned earlier inoculating adults will be a different ball game altogether and will require the help of ngos and partner members partner members here are you know the unicef and who will become a very important at decentralized level for example on cold chain requirements and cold chain you know tracking unicef has played a very very important role in india's immunization program so th- their role bec- will become very important who has been able to build a lot of protocols at the ground level so when we talk about this task forces that are being set being formed at the state level like if i give an example of tamil nadu which has already roped in the melinda gates foundation as its partner member of course you will have who unicef with a lot of states partnering so the training essentially will be given by them and of course hand handling by the doctors at the district level and all of that you have a very strong network of anms you know who will be trained but beyond training it's also about then reporting that will be a big challenge reporting of the possible adverse reactions that we have talked about earlier so just to recap the challenges are of the adverse reactions the fact that there are going to be multiple candidates and the training of community healthcare workers we will talk a bit more about this last group a bit later but apart from this there are also logistical and technological challenges like that of tracking both the vaccine candidates and the vaccine beneficiaries that is the people who will get the vaccine conan first explains why the vaccines themselves will have to be tracked so a vaccine basically these are all what we call as you know temperature control so they work only at a specific temperatures if you consider r3 vaccine candidates these work in the range of 2 to 8 degrees so you need to track them from point a point b point c that they are in this range so for for that you have different mechanisms in place so what happens if they are out of this range so when you actually vaccinate then their potency is is completely nullified so then you are you are first firstly you are wasting the resource and then you have to again vaccinate that person so tracking them in terms of temperatures is very important and this problem further gets complicated because there are multiple vaccine candidates although it's between 2 to 8 degrees you have very specific temperatures between this range so a zydus cadilla will have a temperature that has to be tracked you have the bharat biotech that has to be tracked separately and then you will have your oxford vaccine that has to be tracked so that is the first aspect of it the second aspect is tracking the vaccine beneficiaries which doesn't happen in india's current immunization programs for example if i am the beneficiary this infrastructure will allow me to schedule my vaccination and then uh, it will tell me where i'm supposed to go and get it so that's like an election like a polling booth so when i go there then it will give me a set time if it's a two dose vaccine then i have to come on that particular day the second dose so after the second dose they'll tell you these are the symptoms that you need to track so if these are the symptoms that you need to track and if there is no adverse event reporting then there is a qr code and you get a digital certificate and then you say that yes you have been vaccinated that component also has been added in what is the tracking mechanism so not just the temperature but you also have this aspect that has been added conan says that this data being tracked will then be used by the government to understand how effectively the vaccine is working the blueprint of this technology and the it platform for it he says has been prepared and the government has already started using it to create a database of healthcare workers who will be immunized first but apart from this the infrastructure will also be required for the cold storage of the different vaccines so just on the how many cold storage points we have we have around 29000 of the universal immunization program so government is now saying that that's enough for the first round of which is the priority group of healthcare workers on that front we are very uh, comfortable is what the government is saying however when when it is being expanded to the entire population or extended to the entire population you might have to rope in uh, other players 
you might have to rope in the food processing industry you might have to rope in um, you know other logistic services that is something that government is still wait is going to do like a wait and watch thing because it will be purely dependent on the supply and demand of vaccines if you have more supply then you can vaccinate a larger population but in the first few months at least for the first 4 5 months you will have them in scarcity so only your priority groups are going to get vaccinated it's not the entire population so for that we have a very very ready cold storage requirements the other thing he points out is that cold storage only has to do with temperature and so in that case specific sectors don't matter so you can easily rope in these people even you know in a few weeks before you actually have to extend it to the entire population so that shouldn't be a problem at all it's just a question of understanding where is your uh, exact vaccination uh, center you know how many doses so if you have that data in place which the government still doesn't have then you can actually decide of roping in how many more extra players what the government calls as augmentation of cold chain earlier kon talked about how immunization in a country as vast as india is going to be a challenge especially when there are thousands of villages where access is still remote india though at least to some degree does have experience doing it chatisgarh for example has been successfully carrying out year round vaccination drives for various diseases even during the pandemic and here it is the community health workers like anganwadi workers that play an important role we spoke to gargi varma who reports on chatisgarh for the newspaper about the challenges that they face in the state there are villages where anganwadi workers and anm workers have to travel for say 12 hours or even 5 to 6 hours where they have to trek up a hill or cross rivers those kind of access issues are always there in chatisgarh uh, when we talk about immunization we are not just talking about the people who are going but also the vaccine or the medicine and carrying that to say a far off village is the first challenge that any health worker faces on the ground and of course after that there are tribal issues such as people not having a lot of faith in the medicine they want being traditional methods so to speak there are also issues of awareness where after vaccination children get fever and parents get scared that the vaccination is actually harming their child and they don't want to take their second or third children to say get vaccinated so convincing and sort of getting them to get their children vaccinated is the second hurdle this hurdle gargi says is primarily tackled by community healthcare workers called mitanins they are volunteers okay so they are not paid for their work they are given incentives for immunization very meager amount of money but these mitanins actually go door to door they talk to the new mothers they talk to family members they convince people tell them in their own way so these people are trained by the health department annually and they then go ahead and talk about vaccination importance of vaccination ways of vaccination challenges the convincing and the changing of mindset sort of happens on the community level because she knows and understand these people and their fears So the mitanin has really changed a lot in the tribal areas of Chhattisgarh. She is the one who's going around convincing and sometimes even getting children because parents are busy, parents make excuses. So in our story we have spoken about Malti who's a mitanin in uh, one of the villages in Dantewada who has a very clear approach of getting children to say vaccination centers. If the parents make excuse, she takes the children her- herself. And because the parents know her it's easier for them to trust her that you know she's not taking the children away she's just taking them to the health center and back so that is how a lot of the battle is being fought as of right now though the covid-19 vaccine like we talked about earlier will pose its own set of challenges in a state like chatisgarh so this is something that we are seeing with covid specifically the covid vaccine needs to be at a certain temperature it is susceptible to thermal shock whenever it comes out people will have a challenge the health department in chatisgarh will face a challenge of the last mile connectivity so to speak because there's no way you can carry a huge deep freezer over a hill or wade through the water 
especially during the summer months when the vaccine is supposed to be cure the preparations however are already underway the state she says is following the government of india guidelines which say that the first phase of the vaccine will go to the frontline healthcare workers both government and private so as of right now the state is making a big database of all the health workers including the anm workers the anganwadi workers and the mitanins and uh, they are sort of identifying these people people working in the private sector as well in the rural and urban areas and there's a database that is being made so that whenever the vaccine comes these people are easily contactable and traceable on the other hand they're also uh, in chatisgarh we are trying to increase the cold chain points the immunization department in chatisgarh has asked for uh, more walk-in coolers and deep freezers from the central government which the central government has promised them that they would supply so of course we are trying to set up infrastructure because till now the immunization program was focused at only 3 to 4% of the population whereas now we're talking about 100% of the population being immunized or being vaccinated so of course we would need to ramp up our infrastructure very much so that's what is going on as of right now dear listeners before we move on to the rest of the show i just wanted your quick attention one of the big reasons people say they like this show is because it helps them understand the news better it provides them with the context they need to see the bigger picture and there is perhaps no other place that does that better than indian express's explained section we on three things refer to the section regularly and it helps us make this show if you're a regular reader of indian express you know how useful the explained section can be especially when you're looking for in-depth analysis by the right experts you can log on to indianexpress.com/explained and access the coverage 24/7 explained by indian express where news that matters is explained by experts who know the subject now back to the show and next we talk about uttar pradesh in a previous episode we had talked about how up had become the first state to pass an ordinance against what it said were forced religious conversions for marriage according to the law a marriage will be declared null and void if the sole intention of the marriage is to change a girl's religion the law has been described as problematic by many legal experts for one it assumes that every religious conversion for marriage is unlawful unless you've had prior permission from the government many also point out that it effectively makes interfaith marriages difficult to take place in the state now an example of this took place in lucknow last week when a wedding was stopped citing this law after complaints from hindu outfits in this segment asad rahman who reported on the story joins us to talk about it asad you recently reported about this wedding that was supposed to take place in lucknow but which was stopped could you talk about this wedding in question and the people that were involved in it so on december 2 there was a wedding that was happening in lucknow's tuda colony which comes under the para police station limits and a uh, hindu girl was marrying a muslim boy and they had planned to get married uh, following rituals of both the hindu religion as well as muslim religion and on the second itself on the day of the wedding uh, some hindu outfits in the area called up the police and lodged a written complaint that this is in violation of the new ordinance that has come out to prevent conversion in the state and police took cognizance of the complaint and reached the wedding venue and then uh, stopped the wedding and told both the families of the bride and the bridegroom that if they have to get married and if they are marrying outside their religion then they have to notify the dm at least 2 months in advance and only then can they get married under the special marriage act you mentioned that the wedding was stopped keeping the new ordinance in mind the uttar pradesh prohibition of unlawful conversion of religion ordinance what does this ordinance say about a situation like this so the ordinance what the police is saying and i'm reading from the ordinance is that because these two people were getting married by hindu and muslim rituals so informally they were converting and they were having a hindu ritual when the police had reached and that is what the police has an issue with and they the senior police officers in lucknow are quoting the new ordinance and they are quoting section 3 of the new ordinance which says that no and i am quoting here 
no person shall convert or attempt to convert either directly or otherwise and now the focus here is on otherwise either directly or otherwise and any other person from one religion to another by use or practice of misrepresentation force undue influence coercion allurement or by fraudulent means or by marriage nor shall any person abet convince or conspire such conversion so this is what the law reads and it the interpretation of the law by the police officers here in lucknow is that if someone is getting married if a muslim is getting married according to hindu rituals then that in a way is a form of conversion so then according to the police what should they have done what should the couple have done in this case so the uh, police is saying that if the two want to get married they will have to get married under the special marriage act and if one gets married under the special marriage act neither of them have have to convert and under provisions of the special marriage act you have to notify the district officials prior to the wedding a month prior to the wedding and then a notice is pasted at both the houses and then if no objection is raised and no issue is raised on this the families of both the girl and the boy agree then after a month an noc is given by the district administration or the concerned district magistrate so the police is saying that if these two have to get married they have to get married under the special marriage act and neither of them can convert and in that case they have to notify the district administration well in advance which is what the couple have not done and what the couple is saying what the family of the girl and the youth are saying is that they did not know about the law because the date for this wedding was fixed 2 months ago and they did not know about the new law and hence they were getting married following rituals of both hindu and muslim traditions and the up police as you say have viewed the wedding as a conversion but what do the couple have to say about whether either of them want to convert or not yeah so both the sides in this case say that they are not going to convert and they are going to continue practicing their respective religions the boy is going to continue being a muslim and the girl the woman is going to continue being a hindu and they are both going to respect each other's faith and accept the person as well as their religious identity the way it is without converting to each other's religion so considering this case where you have a couple where they don't even want to convert into a different religion and yet their ceremony their wedding was seen as a form of conversion by the up police in that sense what concerns does it raise about this new law and you know the prospect of interfaith marriages in up so now what happens is that a lot of marriages between interfaith marriages that used to happen anywhere in the country one of the people used to convert in order to avoid this clause where your name and your address and this notice is pa- pasted at the marriage registrar office and at your respective houses because a lot of families are against these marriages now what happens is that because of this new ordinance what will happen is that this conversion has been made illegal and it's for marriage like you cannot convert to get married so it will make it compulsory for the couples to get married under the special marriage act which means that this process this procedure of notices getting pasted and whatever opposition there is from the family or from local outfits is going to become a bit of a problem for couples getting married interfaith couples getting married in the state because social scrutiny will happen and maybe neighbors might get involved and have an issue with a hindu person marrying a muslim person or vice versa or a muslim neighborhood having an issue with a marriage into the hindu community so that's where it's going to make it a bit difficult and it will take time and it will also face societal pressure from both sides where you know if objections are raised and maybe local outfits might get involved and discourage the couple from getting married and you know also stigma around interfaith marriages will also increase so this was one such case that came under the scrutiny of this new law how many other such cases do we know about so this is a case where no offense has been committed and hence the police have not lodged a, a case and have not lodged an fir in this case because there was consent from both sides whereas uh, under the new law for the new ordinance at least four cases have been reported from different parts of the state the first one was from bareilly 
where uh, it was alleged that the Muslim man who was getting married to a Hindu woman was forcibly converting the uh, woman and had allegedly, it has been alleged by the uh, woman's family that he had kidnapped the woman and was forcibly converting her and which, if proven in a court of law, can result in jail uh, for up to five or ten years. And in the end, we talk about Andhra Pradesh. At least 227 persons, including several children, some of them as young as four years old, have taken ill in Eluru in West Godavari district of Andhra Pradesh. According to a report by our correspondent Srinivas Janiala, officials suspect it could be a case of water contamination, but viral encephalitis is also not being ruled out. A medical officer at Eluru Government Hospital said that the people who fell sick, especially children, suddenly started vomiting after complaining of burning sensation in their eyes. Some of them fainted or suffered bouts of seizures. People who fell sick belong to four societies of Ashoknagar and Arundhati Pet in Eluru town, where a case of contamination of drinking water was reported 10 days back. District collector Raju said that health officials have started a door-to-door survey of the affected areas to check for water contamination. Meanwhile, the opposition Telugu Desam party has criticized the government for neglecting drinking water sources. In a statement, the party chief Chandra Babu Naidu said, quote, This is apathy of the Andhra Pradesh government. The drinking water bodies have not been cleaned since 18 months and due to that, more than 150 have taken ill. Eluru is the health minister's constituency and it is the irresponsible YSRCP government's collective lack of conscience and inability to govern yet again. You were listening to Three Things by The Indian Express. Today's show was written and produced by me, Shashank Bhargav, and as always was edited and mixed by a producer, Joshua Thomas. Before we go, here's another reminder to check out Indian Express's Explain section. You can log on to indianexpress.com slash explain and find in-depth analysis by the right experts. It has everything you need to know to understand the news better and see the bigger picture. If you like this show, then you can subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it, share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can also tweet us at Express Audio and write to us at podcast at indianexpress.com.